Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome back to my five Victorian novels about series. Today I'm going to be telling you about five Victorian novels that are about the past. So if you haven't seen one of these videos before, what I do in this little mini series on my channel is talk about five Victorian novels that deal with a particular theme or a particular topic. I haven't made one of these videos for a while, but over the last month I have been hosting a historical fiction readathon, so I thought today I would make a video about some Victorian historical fiction, some books that were written in the Victorian period um, but are set before the Victorian period, looking at different periods of time. So today I have five Victorian novels to tell you about, all of which are about the past, all of which are about history and set in a time previous to the time that they're written. There was a lot of historical fiction written during the Victorian period. There are many books that I could have included in this video, but these are just five Victorian works of historical fiction that I really love, so I thought I would tell you about them today. So I'm going to go through them in order of the times they are set. So I'm going to start off with Lois the Witch by Elizabeth Gaskell. Um, this is a novella by Elizabeth Gaskell, a really fantastic novella, which was published first in 1859, um, but it's actually set in 1692. So it's set in 17 century and it's actually set not in Britain but in America um, and it's set during the Salem witch trials. One of the things I love about Elizabeth Gaskell is like the variety within her writing and that she wrote about so many different things um, and I really really like Lois the Witch for that because I think it is a really really interesting novella um, and quite different as well. So Lois the Witch is about a girl called Lois, um, a British girl who after the death of her family um, is forced to go across the seas to America to seek out her uncle in order to to try and find a home for herself and a life for herself um, and she ends up in Salem and Massachusetts um, just before all the witch trials are happening and obviously as the title suggests um, she ends up being accused of witchcraft. The book is about Lois's life, her experiences in Salem, um, her relationship with her extended family and why they might start to turn against her um, and of course it is about the witch trials. I really love Lois the Witch for a lot of reasons. It was a really really interesting read, it's very compelling, um, very clever and really intriguing um, but one of the things I also love about Lois the Witch is that it is a really really interesting book to look at both in terms of like talking about the Salem witch trials but also how the Victorians viewed the Salem witch trials especially because the Salem witch trials are like quite prevalent in popular culture and like, I do feel like they are pretty well known so it's really interesting to read like a Victorian perspective on them um, and see what the Victorians thought about them and it's also really interesting because Gaskell is very much writing about it in the mid 19th century from the approach of look how awful it was we would never do that now we're so much better we're a really improved society and we've made so much progress which is just really interesting to read from something that is 150 years old and um, to read how they were looking back on the past and thinking about all the progress they'd made especially because you know we will be now looking back on the Victorian period thinking about all the progress we've made but when you look back on the Victorian period thinking about all the progress they've made from 150 years before you also see that there's always more progress to be made and always things to change and um, so I just find that really really interesting it's something that I really like about reading historical fiction from the past is that you you're both learning about the bit of history that they're writing about but you're also learning about the bit of history that they were writing within and how that affected their view of the past and I feel like that's very clear in Lois the Witch that feeling in the text of like you know this wouldn't happen now because we're more of our society and that's something I find really interesting in Lois the Witch so a really really interesting book um, it's quite a short novella as well fantastic work by Elizabeth Gaskell definitely one I would recommend the next Victorian work of historical fiction I wanted to mention was The House by the Churchyard by J. Sheridan Le Fanu, which was published in 1863 and is set in 1767. So this is set in the mid 18th century um, and this is a bit of a sensationist novel. So the book actually begins um, later on than the mid 18th century um, when a graveyard is being dug up um, and a skull is found with lots of unusual holes in um, and then we go back in time um, um, to the mid 18th century to find out the mystery behind this and various other things. There's a lot that I really like about The House by the Churchyard. In general, I love J. Sheridan Le Fanu and I think he is a really underrated Victorian writer. Um, he writes a lot of kind of gothic and sensationist stuff and he is fantastic at it. And The House by the Churchyard is a really wonderful story about a small town outside of Dublin, um, some soldiers stationed there and everyone else who's there with lots of mystery and secrets and attempted murder and an absolutely wonderful villain and a few love stories going on to and it's just a really wonderful kind of adventurous read with a lot of 
mysterious gothic stuff going on. I think one of the things that's really interesting is looking at the house by the churchyard as a work of historical fiction um, and looking at how Jay Sheridan the family was kind of using this setting of a hundred years before it was written um, to kind of like play up all the kind of gothic and mysterious stuff about the past. Um, the past being this space where, you know, more mystery and danger could happen, where more people kind of carried weapons, where there was more kind of tension and potential for supernatural things to happen. I do find it really interesting that often when the Victorians were writing about kind of more gothic things, they often set their books um, that were more gothic in the past, or they set them on continental Europe. Um, the idea being that like, obviously in Victorian Britain, nothing, nothing too mysterious could happen. But if you go abroad or if you or were further back in the past, that's where all the magical, supernatural, ghostly things might have happened, which I think is kind of interesting to see. Um, and the house by the churchyard definitely does kind of play with that feeling of the past being a slightly more dangerous place. It's a really fantastic read and definitely one I'd recommend, especially if you're interested in Victorian historical fiction. The next book I wanted to mention is A Tale of Two Cities, by Charles Dickens. Um, this is a very famous work of Victorian historical fiction. So A Tale of Two Cities was published in 1859, but it is set before and during the French Revolution. Um, and the two cities of the title are London and Paris. So this book is set between London and Paris. We're following various characters and how they kind of get caught up in the French Revolution. So the book begins when um, a man who has been imprisoned in the Bastille for a long time um, comes to England to be reunited with his daughter. Um, and then several years later, they end up getting caught up in the events of the French Revolution um, through various circumstances and through various other characters that they are connected to. There's a lot that I love about A Tale of Two Cities. I think it is a really strong, amazing Dickens novel with one of Dickens' best endings, I want to say. It's not one of my absolute favourite Dickens books, though I do love it a lot, but the ending, the ending is superb um, and it is a really, really fantastic read. I also think it has one of his best, like, antagonists. Madame Defarge is fantastic and I love her and um, she is a truly amazing character and I think Charles Dickens is doing something interesting where he is trying to show kind of both sides of the argument for the French Revolution I suppose. There's a lot that I really love about A Tale of Two Cities but one of the things I find most interesting about it is looking at it as a work of historical fiction and looking at it as an interpretation, a Victorian interpretation of the French Revolution. When I was at university I actually did a module which was about the history of the history of the the French Revolution. Not about the history of the French Revolution, but about the history of the history of the French Revolution, which was awesome in so many ways. I love that kind of meta stuff. So we were doing a module where we were looking a little bit about what actually happened in the French Revolution, but mostly we were looking at what historians and writers and different people in different ages and different times and different parts of the world had had to say about the French Revolution and how they interpreted it as historians. It was fascinating. And I wrote my essay uh, for that module on... Um, Charles Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities and Thomas Carlyle's History of the French Revolution and how they both as Victorians were interpreting the French Revolution and what they were saying about the French Revolution and how they viewed it, which was absolutely fascinating. And I do think that if you know a bit about the French Revolution and if you've read any history books or if you've read other novels set in the French Revolution, then you might find it really interesting to read A Tale of Two Cities because it is about the French Revolution, but it is also very much a Victorian take on the French Revolution and the Victorians, what well, they thought about the French Revolution, which is fascinating. You know, he does have a historical argument that he is making through A Tale of Two Cities about why the French Revolution happened and who was to blame, how it began with one intention and what it became. Um, and I feel like that is just absolutely fascinating to look at both like as someone interested in um, the history of the French Revolution, but also someone interested in the history of the Victorian period and how the Victorian period thought about things. And actually, I find it really fascinating to look at the Victorians and how they thought of um, the French Revolution, because basically the Victorians were terrified of revolution. A lot of Victorian society is like fear of revolution and like looking at France and being afraid of what if that happened here. You know, if you read other Dickens books, his books are full of social criticism. A Tale of Two Cities is, you know, commenting on 19th century France, but also criticizing, um, you know, what happens when the elite of a society don't listen to everyone else in the society who is beneath the elite. Like, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. I feel like um, I'm really rambling on a lot more than I usually do in my five Victorian novels about videos. So let's move on to the next book. Next, I want to talk about Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, one of my favourite books, a book that I love very, very much. So Wuthering Heights was published in 1847 and it is set um, kind of from the 1770s through to 1802. Um, 
And the Wuthering Heights is a really interesting one because I don't think it's one that we immediately think of as a work of historical fiction, especially because um, kind of unlike Lois the Witch or A Tale of Two Cities um, or the next book I'm going to talk about, it's not about a specific historical event. But actually, I think it is really, really important that Wuthering Heights is set a fair way before it was written. Wuthering Heights is set in the late 18th century. It is not about Victorian society, although of course it is. Um, it's about late 18th century society. And I think there are a few things that this means for Wuthering Heights. Anyway, let me backtrack and tell you what Wuthering Heights is about. If you don't know, Wuthering Heights is a story of two kind of feuding families over several decades um, and two generations, starting with um, what happens when one family of the neighbourhood, the Earnshaws, adopts a boy called Heathcliff, um, who ends up becoming rather a disruptive force in many ways to the neighbourhood. Um, and it's about Heathcliff, about the Earnshaw family, and about another family who live nearby called the Lintons, and what happens to this family over two generations. I do think it's really key that Wuthering Heights is a work of historical fiction. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the Victorians, when they're writing about more gothic things, anything potentially supernatural, often do like to set it in the past, as though to suggest it couldn't happen now, but maybe it could have happened then. Um, and Wuthering Heights definitely has a lot of supernatural undertones. Um, I think there are lots of arguments to be made in Wuthering Heights about whether events are actually supernatural or just imagined um, and have a rational explanation, um, but certainly setting the book in the 18th century rather than in the 19th century chiefly, um, I think it does give Emily Bronte like the opportunity to um, suggest a possibility of a more supernatural world. And also it gives her the possibility to write about a much wilder world. Wuthering Heights is quite a shocking book in many ways, um, still even now, um, and definitely was very shocking when it was published. And I think if Emily Bronte had written this story set in the time that she was publishing it, I think it would have been considered more shocking, where in a way, because she's writing about people in the late 18th century, 50 years before the book was being published, she almost could have more of a license to suggest that these people were doing worse, more shocking, wilder things, because it felt like, you know, maybe we've moved on since then, maybe this wouldn't happen now. Setting it in the past gives her the ability to write about a kind of wilder, more disruptive cast of characters, I suppose. I also think that Emily Bronte does something really interesting in Wuthering Heights with like the turn of the century. Um, so the book begins in 1801 with a character called Lockwood. Um, and 1801, it is important to say, would have at this point in time been considered the first year of the new century. 1800 was not considered the first year. 1801 was considered the first year. I don't even really know why, but I do know that is true. Anyway, so the book starts in 1801, first year of the new century, um, and a character called Lockwood arrives at Wuthering Heights um, and ends up being told the story of everything that's happened. Um, so the story he's being told is an 18th century story, but he is existing in the 19th century. So he is part of this new modern world, hearing about this past, and it's the new modern world, 19th century, which might provide a possibility of hope for the future and a less wild future to come. So that is something that Emily Bronte is doing really, really interestingly in Wuthering Heights with that kind of historical setting and playing with history and time and that turn of the century as being like a bit of a break from what came before, as well as, as I said, the historical setting giving her the opportunity to write about what seems like a kind of wilder society, I suppose. I also think the historical setting is important for like the isolation of Wuthering Heights because by the 1840s, parts of the North were becoming slightly more industrialised. Um, there weren't trains everywhere, but train lines were springing up. Um, and so I think Emily Bronte kind of purposely sets Wuthering Heights before trains and um, before more urbanisation, where society was kind of even more isolated. Um, and that is kind of really important, I think, to Wuthering Heights. So yeah, Wuthering Heights, great work of Victorian historical fiction. Highly recommend it. Um, really interesting to look at as a work of historical fiction as well. Finally, the fifth book I wanted to mention today is The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. This was published in 1880, um, but it's set during the Napoleonic Wars, um, I think kind of around 1805. Um, and The Trumpet Major is a really interesting novel for lots of reasons. Um, it's a really great Thomas Hardy novel, actually, very, very underrated. Um, and it chiefly follows a young woman um, who is torn between two brothers and um, two men who are rather different from each other. And there is a third man who's interested in her as well, um, who she doesn't really like and is a bit scary. Um, um, so, you know, 
typical Hardy love square, lots of drama going on. Um, but one of the things I really like about the Trumpet Major that I find really interesting is its historical setting. It's set in 1805, um, and kind of throughout the book, there runs this thread of fear of French invasion. All of the characters are basically afraid all the time that um, Napoleon is like about to land on English shore and kill everyone. And the kind of like severe threat level that runs through the book because of that, how that kind of changes the stakes for everyone, how that affects the characters who might be in the military, um, and kind of how that affects society, that constant fear, um, especially because this is set in a coastal town. So they are, you know, literally thinking that people are going to show up on the shore, on the coast, any moment it could happen, is really, really interesting. And I also think it's really interesting to read um, if you like Jane Austen, because basically The Trumpet Major is set in a similar time to a lot of Jane Austen's books, um, maybe five years earlier. Um, but basically it's set around the same time as Jane Austen's books. And Jane Austen's books, a lot of them are set during the Napoleonic Wars, and there's a lot of soldiers and a lot of naval men, but we never talk about the war. And that's fascinating in Jane Austen. I can talk about that a lot another day. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting about The Trumpet Major is that it is set in that time, but it does really explore and talk about the threat of war and the threat of invasion in the way that clearly Jane Austen didn't feel she could talk about. Um, and I think it is really interesting as well to read The Trumpet Major and then think about Jane Austen's novels in the light of this was a society where they did think they might be invaded by Napoleon um, at some point. So The Trumpet Major is fascinating to read um, and it's really interesting to look at that kind of Victorian reflection on early 1800s and kind of what life was like or society was like and what it was like to live during a war. So it's just a really interesting read and another great Victorian work of historical fiction. So there we have it, those are five Victorian novels about the past. Um, do let me know if you've read any of these or what you thought of them. Um, let me know down in the comments as well if there are any other Victorian books that are um, set in time periods previous to the Victorian period that you really like. I hope you've all been enjoying the historical fiction readathon if you've been taking part. And that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.